Hey guys, my name is Caleb Walden. I'm an intern here at Shepherd's Youth. It is good to be with you here. I love you too, Sam. If you guys would, would you please pray with me before we jump into our message? God, God, it is good to be able to come into your house and worship you and learn about you. God, I ask that uh, as, I, as I deliver this message that you would be speaking through me. God, may the, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you. And will you speak through me, God? It is in your name I pray. It is in your name we are here. Amen. I was 18 years old, senior in high school, and my mentor, Dave Durham, gave me this book. I hated reading when he gave it to me, but I, I love Dave Durham, so he gave me this book. It's called We Put a Man on the Moon. And I started reading it, and I kind of, it was one of those books where you started reading and you can't put it down, so I finished it all in like a week. I know, I can't, that was fast for me, okay? I, at the time, I hated reading, so I finished the book in a week, and the whole idea in the book is, is that when you're 80 years old, sitting around with your friends, sitting around with the people you love, you're not really gonna care about how much money you had, you're not gonna care about how many houses you have, how many exotic sports cars. He said those, those things might be important. You might wanna leave something to your family, but the most important thing is gonna be the memories you have with the people that you love. When you're sitting around when you're 80, you wanna have the stories that you can talk to your friends about and reminisce and laugh. He said you wanna live a life that will be a great story. And I remember reading that and being really inspired. I'm 18, I'm about to graduate high school, so, so I, go, I go to my friends and I'm like, guys, Josh Kyle, Corey Howler, and Daniel Barnes, those are my three friends. I'm like, guys, we gotta do something we're gonna remember the rest of our lives. We gotta do something wild. All my friends know, I love, I love to say, we gotta do something wild, something we're gonna remember forever. And they're like, all right, what are we gonna do? Well, it just so happened, one of our friends, Shannon, had, had accepted a job in Texas at a summer camp. So I said, here's the deal. Let's take a road trip right after graduation to Texas. And they're like, okay, that sounds awesome. The problem was we had no money. We had no money, we had no jobs. So what we did is, is I said, okay, I did the math. The, the amount of gas we'll need, and we'll, we'll, it'll cost about 100 bucks. And then we'll spend $10 a night on campsites. We'll get campsites all the way there and we'll sleep in a tent. We'll buy our food at Walmart, make it at night. And they're like, that's an amazing idea. I told my parents and they said yes for some reason. So. What I did is I didn't have any money, so I walked around my school, Heritage Christian, represent, and I literally, I asked people, I said, hey, I'm trying to drive to Texas. Could you give me like five bucks for gas? Almost everybody I asked said yes, and I'm not lying to you, literally, from asking people, I raised like $150 with some gas cards as well to pay for my trip to Texas, and we got together, we stopped in Flagstaff, Arizona, and while we're in Flagstaff, Arizona, we set up this campsite, went hiking to this river, and then we went to make our first dinner, and our electric stove we brought didn't work. So well, things aren't really working out, right? But what we did is we ended up, you know those camp lanterns? You know what I'm talking about? Where like they use gas and they have the flat top and they heat up? So we had this Italian sausage, and we cooked our dinner, our Italian sausage, on top of the camp lantern. I'll never forget that. And then the next night we stop in New Mexico and then we get all the way to Texas and we're in Texas and that night we're all sleeping in our tent. I was asleep, but we're, um, Corey, Corey Halloran gets up and apparently was making weird noises going, ah, 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 and then he fell on top of my friend Josh and my friend Josh got up and was like, dude, what are you doing? So he's like, I'm gonna, he, Corey had a cot and Josh was on the floor. He's like, I'm stealing your bed for that in the middle of the night. So he gets up. In the morning, Corey wakes up and had bitten through his tongue and apparently he had had a seizure, but we had no idea. So we had to take Corey to the hospital. He ended up being okay, but I had to call Corey's mom and tell her, I'm like, Corey had a seizure while we were here. It was fine. It ended up being funny because we're like, dude, Josh, he had a seizure and you straight up stole his bed. <laughs> and, and I mean, the trip was amazing. The, the car ride, it was long. We spent most of our time in the car, but we had these deep conversations. We had stupid conversations. We argued about anything. It, but it was so much fun. And those are some of the best memories of my life. I still, I'll get together with these guys. And that's one of the first things we'll start talking about when we're all together. Remember when we did that road trip? Oh my goodness, that was so much fun. Dude, I'm gonna remember that the rest of my life. So everything I wanted, everything this book talked about, living a good story with your friends, I got in that memory, and it was amazing. And I crave times like that. I crave memories like that, and I think you do too. 
I, I think we all crave adventures with our friends. We crave, uh, we crave and we want stories that we can sit around and talk about and laugh about for the rest of our lives. And the reason why is because you were created for friendship. That's my first point on this sermon outline. The reason why we crave this is because you were created by God for friendship. Check this out. I thought this was so cool when I found this as I was studying for the sermon. Genesis, I think it's Genesis 2.18, right? Genesis 2.18 says this. And the Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. It is not good for man to be alone. Right there. We're created for friendship. It's not good to be alone. But check this out. This is in the Garden of Eden. Adam has just been created by God. Adam is literally walking side by side with God, talking to him. Adam has a perfect relationship with God, and he spends all of his time with him in paradise. And God says, it's not good for man to be alone. That blew my mind. That, that, that shows me that, that all of you, and out of everybody in this room, if you spend more time with God than anybody else, if you, if you know God's face and you know his voice and you listen to him and you spend time with him and you have the best relationship of anybody in here, if that's you, you can still be lonely and missing something if you don't have good friends. Because we were created for friendship. How many of you guys have seen the movie Cast Away? Yeah? yeah? Oh, come on. Thank you, man. Oh, my goodness. I, I was surprised. I thought, I thought none of you guys would have seen it. But Cast Away, for those of you that don't know, Tom Hanks, uh, same guy who's in Forrest Gump, which is the greatest movie of all time. Tom Hanks gets trapped on this island all alone. And, and what happens is while he's on this island all alone, he has this volleyball. I, I think we have a picture of it. He has this volleyball that, Wilson, it's Wilson. Oh, my goodness, Wilson. And he paints the face on the volleyball, right? And, and what happens is the whole movie, he goes around talking to the volleyball. He's on this island for years, and he talks to the volleyball. He's like, Wilson, I need to get off the island. He's talking to the volleyball. Why? It's actually, I know it's a movie, but it's a really interesting psychological principle. It's called anthropomorphism. Anthropomorphism is basically when we as humans are alone for too long, we so need human contact in relationships that we project human emotions and actions onto objects like a volleyball. Our minds and hearts and everything about us so longs friendship, then when we don't have it, something stops working correctly because we were created for friendship. Which is exactly why we're doing this series here at Shepherd Youth on friendship. And I want to tell you that for some of you, this is the most important series you will ever hear in all of your time at Shepherd Youth. Because besides your relationship with God, your friendships affect you and influence you more than anything else. So this week, we're going to talk about some uh, basics of friendship, friendship wisdom. Next week, we're going to talk about how do you make friends. Then we'll talk about how do you stay loyal in friendships and keep a friendship. And then we'll talk about when your friendships have fights, how do you make it work. And I promise you this sermon is going to be worth it because friendship is one of the most important things in your life. So today I want to start by saying this. You're created for friendship, but what that means is that loneliness can be very, very powerful. Loneliness is one of the most depressing things any of us can ever feel. And it's also fairly common. Since we have such a desire for friendship within us, if we don't have good friends around us, loneliness creeps in very quickly and it starts to tell you you're not loved, you're, you're not good enough, no one wants to hang out with you. And it just, it can be so, so depressing. So if you've ever been lonely or if you're lonely today, here's what I want to tell you. First off, I want to tell you you're normal. It's, it's, it happens to everybody. Everybody feels lonely sometimes. It's because we're created for friendship. But I also want to tell you to pay attention in this series. Because God has friendships there ready for you. God is going to bring godly friendships into your life when the time is right. The second thing I want to say to you, it's also the second point of my sermon is this. This is really important. You can't let the fear of loneliness lead you to wrong friendships. Loneliness is, is a very, very powerful motivator, but you can't let it lead you to the wrong friendships. So if you feel lonely, sometimes what we do is we, we play sports or we're in a class with somebody a lot, and we just kind of latch onto their friendship because they like us, but maybe they're not the best friend for us. When I was eight years old, I, I met my friend Josh Kyle, the same guy I went on a trip with. I was eight years old. 
And we were best friends all the way through. I, I mean, we're still best friends. But I remember starting at eight years old, I would go to this dude's house every single weekend. Literally, he lived in Simi Valley uh, off of Stearns, and I would drive over every weekend, spend the whole weekend there, drive back home, go to school, and over summer, I would spend weeks at his house. I, I called his dad, dad. There was, I called his mom, mom. His sister called me her little brother. There was a time, this was before all that, there was a time where me and Josh were sitting at Tico's Tacos in Simi Valley. And, and, and I looked at him, I said, dude, you're not even my best friend anymore. He's like, what? He's like, you're my brother. And then from then on, it was, I mean, seriously, we were brothers. And then my freshman year of high school comes around, and his dad comes up to me in the kitchen. He says, Caleb, I, I need to tell you something. I, I accepted a job in Ohio, and we're going to be moving uh, at the end of summer. I remember, I mean, I still get emotional thinking about it because this, this led me into some of the most lonely and depressing times of my life. This is a freshman year, end of freshman year, going into sophomore year. And I remember I would drive through Simi Valley with my parents or my friends, and I would literally start crying because I was so lonely. My brother, my other family ha had gone and left, and I was alone. I was lonely. And what ended up happening is my sophomore year of high school ended up being one of the roughest years of my life. Because I went to football practice, and, and I went to class, and the people I had classes with uh, most consistently, maybe they weren't the best for me to hang out with, but they seemed to like me, and, and I needed that. Or the guys I played on the football team with, or, or volleyball, or basketball, uh, they, they liked me, and, and they joked around with me, and they accepted me, so I clung to that. But I ended up with these regrets in my life. And I ended up doing these things and, and building these habits that I'm still fighting to this day. And luckily, I'm covered by grace. I'm so thankful for God's grace. But I do want to tell you today, and I want to warn you, don't let loneliness lead you into the wrong friendships. Don't let loneliness lead you into the wrong friendships. I learned this acronym at, at college. It's called HALT. HALT. And it's basically, th these are the moments when you're, you're most susceptible or open to do stupid things. HALT. When you're hungry, when you're angry, when you're lonely, and when you're tired. And I was lonely, and I, I, I let my loneliness lead me to the wrong friendship. So I want to tell you, this is what God wants for you. Proverbs 12, 26 says this. The righteous... Choose their friends carefully, but the way of the wicked leads them astray. The righteous choose their friends carefully. They, they don't go out and, and let their loneliness uh, just latch on to the closest people to them. They choose their friends carefully. So I want to say we can't let our, lo our loneliness lead us to the wrong friendships. We need to build godly friendships. But also for others of you, we can't let our fear of loneliness keep us in the wrong friendships. Some of you are already friends with people and you're not lonely, but you know they're not right for you. You know these friends are leading you in the wrong direction. I wanna tell you today, don't let your fear of loneliness keep you in those friendships. Go and find and build some godly relationships. And I, I bet some of you are thinking right now, Caleb, wait, 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 slow down. We're Christians, man. Aren't we supposed to love everybody and be friends with everybody? And I wanna tell you, yes, you, you're absolutely right. We are called to love and be friends with everybody around us. But I want to clarify. Even though G Jesus himself, he loved everybody equally, but there were 12 he spent the majority of his time with, or 12 he spent a lot of his time with, but three people he spent the majority of his time with. It's his inner circle. And what I want to tell you is that while you should love everybody, your inner circle, which I define in your notes as the five people you spend the most time with, the five people you spend the most time with should all be Christians. The five people that you spend the most time with should all be Christians. Why? This is my point number three. Because you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. I, I was looking up articles on this this week. It was so cool. Entrepreneur.com was talking about if you want to be successful in business, you need to have friends who are also going to be successful in business. Sociologists have found this principle. And I think it's so cool when the world starts seeing God's principles built into everyday life. Because look, God says this in Proverbs 13, 20. Walk with the wise and become wise. For a companion of fools suffers much harm. Walk with the wise and become wise. You will be the average of the five people you spend the most time with. So why should we not have non-Christians in our inner circle? Why should we not spend the majority of our time with non-Christians? Because you'll be the average of them. And we, as Christians, we want to be a light for the world. We want to be a light for our non-Christian friends. 
But if we look just like them, we'll just blend in in the darkness. We need five friends who, who are, or three to five, I'm just an inner circle of friends who keep us anchored in God. So that when we go out and we hang out with these other people, we're a light for the world. Your friends shape who you are and what you will do. Another way, you've probably heard it before, but it's so, so good. Show me your friends, I'll show you your future. If you show me your friends, I will show you your future. We have any Dodger fans in the house tonight? Yes, okay, I think they're playing right now, right? Aren't they in the middle of a game? Do we, what, do we know what the score is? Did we lose? That's okay, I'll look after. But Dodger fans, so you all know Clayton Kershaw, right? Check, check this out, Clayton Kershaw grew up with a guy named Matt. Him and Matt played elementary soccer together. They became best friends. Then in, in middle school and high school, they played football, basketball, baseball together. I mean, they just grew up together all the way up through high school. They were best friends. And then Clayton Kershaw goes and he gets drafted. He's at the Dodgers and he becomes one of the greatest pitchers of all time. And his friend Matt, also known as Matthew Stafford, was selected number one overall in the NFL draft. At one point, Clayton Kershaw was the highest paid major league baseball pitcher, pitcher and Matthew Stafford was the highest paid NFL quarterback. And a lot of people look at that and they go, that's crazy, oh my goodness, what, how could that happen? It's not crazy. The, the people you spend the majority of your time with, they either bring you up or they bring you down, they push you. You will be the average of the people you spend the most time with. So I wanna take this moment right now and I wanna ask you, who are the five people you spend the most time with? I tried to make it work on your notes, but it kind of turned out not the way I expected, so you can just write around those little lines. But I really want you to think about this. Think about it in your head, write it on your notes, write it in your phone. Who are the five people you spend the most time with? You will be the average of those people. You will look somewhere in the middle of those people. If they're hard workers, if one of them's a hard worker but one of them's lazy, you'll probably be kind of in the middle. If one of them's really headed for success or one of them really loves God and then another one doesn't, you'll probably be somewhere in the middle because you'll be the average of your five closest friends. So make sure your inner circle is full of people who love God, anchor you, and are pushing you towards the future you want and towards the future God wants for you. And I promise you, the future God wants for you is the future that you want for you. So make sure your friends are doing that. My, my fourth and, and final point is this. You can't live the right life with the wrong friends. You can't live the right life with the wrong friends. First Corinthians 15, 33 says this, do not, be, do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. In other words, it says this, don't think you're the exception. A lot of people hear sermons like this and they're like, yeah, but I'm fine. Uh, peer, pressure doesn't, peer pressure doesn't bother me. Yeah, my friends aren't great, but I'm going to be okay. This is, uh, don't think you're the exception. Bad company corrupts good morals. Don't think you're the exception. You can't live the right life with the wrong friends. And Proverbs 12, 26 says this, the righteous choose their friends carefully, but the way of the wicked leads them astray. That is a key verse today. So what do you want your, your future to look like? What do you want your life to look like? Do you imagine making it to a certain college? Do you imagine playing D1 sports somewhere? Do you imagine being a certain kind of mom or dad, a certain kind of husband or wife? What do you want your future to look like? Do you wanna be a person who's joyful and happy? Then what you need to do is you need to have friends that are headed for those things. I heard, I heard a story of a girl who, who's your age, and basically when she first came to her youth group, I mean, she, I mean she, she was fine, she was normal, but she definitely wasn't headed in the right direction. But as she started hearing more sermons and, and hearing what God wanted for her life, she said, I, I really want to change. So she went and talked to her youth leaders, and she started trying to change, but as they were going through, she realized that, that nothing was happening, nothing was changing. Her friends were still leading her down the wrong path. So her youth leader told her, I, I think you might need to distance yourself from your friends. And she said, that, that, but I might be alone for months. So I, those are my best friends. What am I going to do? But, but they, they encouraged her to do it, so she did it. She distanced herself, and then she got really involved in, in, in their equivalent of, of D groups. She served on the weekends, and she ended up having this total change of best friends, and then a total change in her personality and who she was. 
Her youth leaders, uh, uh, my friends, told me you wouldn't believe how different of a person she was. And here's what I want to tell you. A lot of us think, I I'm who I choose to be. I I'm who I choose to be. But I want to tell you, most of us, we, we aren't. We're, we're basically a product of all the people around us. So if you want to change yourself, if you want to change your future, start by changing your friendships. So I have one more thing I want us to do, and then I'm, I'm going to wrap it up. I want you to think of as many names as you can, of people that you respect, people that you want to look like. They can be your age, they can be younger than you, they can be older than you. I want to think of names of people that you want to look like. When you look at them, you say, they're headed for the future that I want. Or you say, they have the future that I want. They're hard workers. Uh, they're, I mean, they're, they achieve what, what they want to. They set goals. Who, who are these people? People that are nice and loving and seem happy. I want you to think of those names. And then what I want you to do is ask yourself, is there any overlap from the first list you made and the second list? And if there is, if you have friends on both of those lists, I want you to go thank those friends because they're pushing you to be who you want to be. But if there's not, I think it might be time that, that you start taking people out of your inner circle and start investing and building godly friendships. Because you can't live the right life with the wrong friends. Here's where we started. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm just going to bring it all back together. You were created for friendship, right? But since you were created for friendship, loneliness can be very, very powerful. So we can't let the fear of loneliness lead us into the wrong friendships because you will be the average of the five people you spend most of your time with, which means you can't live the right life with the wrong friends. So I have some questions I want to ask you as I close. Do you have genuinely close friendships? When I asked that question in the beginning, who are the five people you spend most of your time with, could you, could you think of people? Could you think of close friends? And I want to tell you that, that if you couldn't, I want to tell you, God has more in store for you because God created you for friendship. And I encourage you to continue coming and listening to the series and learning how to make friends. And next week, we're going to be talking about how do you make friends. Are your friends that you have right now striving for greatness? Do your friends pull you up or do they pull you down? Are your friends focused on loving God with everything that they have? Your friends don't need to have the exact same goals. They don't need to have the exact same picture of their future. But they need to be striving with everything that they have to love God and be the best person they can be. My last question is this. Are there some people in your inner circle that shouldn't be there? Even if you need to replace your whole inner circle, your closest friends, I want to encourage you, don't let the fear of being lonely keep you from finding godly friendships because you can't live the right life when you have the wrong friends. I want to encourage you guys to come back next week as we learn and talk about how do you make and keep godly friendships. Will you guys pray with me? God, thank you so much for... Uh, these students, thank you so much for, uh, for who they are. I, I love them. I care about them. And God, I know you love them and care about them. And God, the reason we're here, the reason we do what we do is because we love you and we want to worship you and we want to live the life that you have called us to live. So God, I, I ask that, um, that as I close, uh, if there's any students who, who need to make a change in their life, you guide them to do that. God, thank you for everything you do. It's in your name I pray. Amen.